delighted to get to be here to chat with Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who normally I see through the CNBC airwaves. Scott, it's great to see you. Thanks a lot. Um, so our panel is called, Will History Repeat Itself? And so I think we'll spend a lot of time looking forward to see what we can do to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But before we do that, I want to take the opportunity to just get your thoughts on the moment we're in now with the Delta wave heading into the fall, the colder weather coming. Did it, is, it as, is it worse than you expected it was going to get after we had this broad rollout of vaccines? And what do you see kind of coming up for us right now with this Delta wave? The reality is, we're going to need to get a higher level of population-wide immunity, either through vaccination or through infection, before we start to see change the transmission break off and we see this wave of infection start to subside. The South clearly has peaked at this point. Um, you're starting to see hospitalizations come down as well. I think what you're going to see is an extended plateau in some of those states as the infection courses its way through the schools. You see declining cases across all age categories except children because of the tragic outbreaks that we're seeing in schools. But overall, you're going to see at, at very worst the plateauing of total cases and probably um, considerable declines across the South. I think the Delta variant still is going to run its course in the North and the Northeast. There's a perception that because cases are coming down the tri-state region, because the positivity rate is falling, that somehow we're through our Delta wave, that we've had the wave of infection that we're going to experience from Delta. I think that's sort of a false start, if you will. I think the Delta bump that we've had this summer in the Northeast and the Northern part of the country really isn't the true surge of infection that we're going to see with Delta. And after people return to school and work, we're in for you know, a rising caseloads around the Northeast and the Northern states. This is going to be a highly regionalized epidemic. Is it going to look as bad as it looked in the South? I certainly don't think so. There's higher vaccination rates, higher population-wide immunity from prior infection. And you see people taking more precautions in this part of the country. I'm, I'm in the New York region right now. Um, people wear masks. Businesses are taking more precautions. So I don't think you're going to see as much spread as you saw in the South. But we are going to experience, I believe, more of a surge of infection before we get through this. On the other side of this, uh, I do think prevalence levels are going to decline uh, as we go through the fall and the winter. This is probably the last big surge of infection we're going to experience. You mentioned the outbreaks we're seeing in schools, and you know we've been hearing about the strain on pediatric hospitals, children's hospitals. What is your sense of, of what the data show in terms of the severity of Delta on children? Is it just because it's so much more contagious, we just see more infections in kids and therefore more hospitalizations in kids? Or is this actually worse? Yeah, you know, the conventional wisdom is it might be slightly worse than the old variant. If you look at the data that CDC's put out, CDC is certainly allowing for the possibility that this variant is slightly more pathogenic than some of the older strains, the B117 and the original Wuhan strain. I think the, the jury's still out. There's some data out of the UK that suggests it's more virulent, that we're seeing higher rates of hospitalization. It's hard to know for sure because we have a numerator and denominator problem. We see the numerator of people who are getting diagnosed and people who are being hospitalized. We don't really have a sense of what the overall denominator is. My hunch is that we're diagnosing um, a fraction of the cases that are actually occurring, maybe as low as one in 10 to one in 20 cases are actually getting diagnosed. So the denominator is much larger than what we perceive. In the sort of peak of the epidemic last winter, we were diagnosing probably one in four cases. I think we're doing a poor job of diagnosing cases now, in part because more of the testing has shifted to home testing or point of care testing that's not getting reported, in part because more of the infections occurring among younger, healthier people, people who've been previously vaccinated, who aren't presenting for testing because they're not getting as sick or they've previously been infected or vaccinated. And they say, well, this can't be COVID. I must have some other viral syndrome. And so they don't present for COVID testing. So I think we have a denominated problem. That said, it's probably slightly more pathogenic if you look at the balance of the data that we're, we're seeing right now. And that would seem to be intuitive because if you have a virus that's creating higher viral loads early in the course of the infection, you would sort of um, assume that it's probably getting a higher percentage of people more sick because they just have more viral burden than with the previous strains. How likely is it, do you think, that a variant will emerge that can outcompete Delta that actually becomes worse? I mean, this this variant in some ways, I mean, it's so contagious, it's terrifying, but the vaccines do still work against it, especially for protecting us from severe disease. You know, we have the mu variant now, we're halfway through the Greek alphabet. There are other variants being watched closely, like C12 in South Africa. Can, do you think a variant will emerge that will be worse than Delta? 
Well, look, this is certainly going to continue to evolve this um, this virus. There's people like Trevor Bedford and others who believe that the virus has mutated very quickly over a short period of time and reached a new fitness level, and it's not going to continue to mutate at this rate. And so far, the variants that we've seen that partially evade the immunity conferred by vaccination or prior infection don't seem to have a fitness advantage over Delta. They don't seem to be spreading appreciably. And it could be that Delta is more contagious and that the immunity offered by Delta is cross resistance to some of these variants. And so they're just not going to be able to penetrate populations that have already ex experienced a big Delta wave. Even the variant that we're seeing, this mu variant that has some of the characteristics of 1351, the variant that was in South Africa, um, some of the immunity conferred by Delta should be protective and maybe even a lot of the immunity conferred by Delta because they have some of the same mutations in them. So I think the reality is that it's going to be hard to see a variant emerge that completely escapes vaccine-induced or an infection-induced immunity. What we can see is variants emerge that partially evade the protections that we have. So they start to spread, but they don't take off like wildfire. And hopefully they, they spread in a fashion that we could see them coming and we're going to be able to reformulate vaccines. That's why I think we're likely to have vaccines that are required to be readministered every year or maybe two years because you're going to want to update the vaccines for some of the new variants that emerge. Well, I want to ask you about drugs, but before that, of course, folks know that you're on the board of Pfizer. Um, thinking about trying to avoid the arising of new variants, a big part of that is vaccinating the world. Uh, the U.S. has bought 500 million doses of Pfizer's vaccine to donate globally, but the inequity in vaccine access has just been, I think, surprising to people. They expected it to some degree, but it's been worse than than a lot of folks expected. Um, what do you expect in terms of the pace of being able to get vaccines globally to protect everybody? I mean, there's a self-interest for the United States in doing that and avoiding these variants. Uh, and then also, how do you think the U.S. government is doing in terms of balancing this plan for booster shots with getting more vaccines out to the world? Yeah, well, look, I don't think it's a zero-sum game in terms of a vaccine that gets used in the United States or Western Europe is a vaccine that's denied to someone in another part of the world. I think that we absolutely need to be doing more to try to get gl vaccines globally distributed. But this is very quickly um, not going to be a supply issue, but a distribution issue and an issue of trying to get people to accept vaccines on a global scale. In fact, I think it's not a supply issue right now, even though you see NGOs still talking about supply limitations. There's a lot of supply in, in the supply chain right now that could be made available to um, a global market. Um, Pfizer has offered more doses to the United States um, than what was taken. Other companies have as well. And the challenge is that there's not um, infrastructure to distribute those vaccines. And we also have the challenge of putting Western vaccines in other markets. We've seen vaccine hesitancy here in the United States. We've seen an unwillingness among a certain portion of our population to accept vaccines here. You're going to see the same reluctance in other parts of the world. Look how challenging it's been to try to eradicate polio, to get the world vaccinated for polio and distribute other vaccines globally. So we need to get more capabilities on the ground. And that's where I think we haven't put as much effort or enough effort um, or enough resources. We need to start USAID and other organizations need to be putting far more resources on the ground. This isn't something that the WHO is going to be able to uh, handle. I think that's why they don't talk about it a lot. And they talk about the supply issues and not the distribution issues. And just to give you sort of a, a snapshot of the next 12 months, Pfizer has said publicly they're going to produce at least 4 billion doses over the next 12 months, next year. Moderna has said, I believe, $3 billion. Um, I believe J&J, &J, once they're partnered with Merck, Merck which they're going to get up to scale this fall, they're going to produce billions of doses a year. Let's just accept maybe 2 billion doses, but maybe better. AstraZeneca is going to produce billions of doses a year. The Serum Institute has committed to producing 4 billion doses a year, and they're actually at scale right now. Um, I believe Sanofi is going to enter the market at some point. And they have tremendous capacity, and so will Novavax, and there's other vaccines behind those. And then you factor in that China is going to vaccinate its population, 1.5 billion people, 1.4 billion people with their vaccines. Russia is going to vaccinate their population. The global population is 7.5 billion people. Um, 2 billion are going to be vaccinated by China and Russia. And then that leaves about 5.5 billion people, 5 billion people. The West has largely been vaccinated at this point. Um, so I've just, you know, sort of soft circled at least 15 billion doses of vaccines that's going to be available to vaccinate maybe three, four billion people that you need to vaccinate at this point. Uh, so there's more than enough supply in the supply chain. The challenge is going to be distribution. Mm. 
Um, I want to ask you also about antiviral drugs. So these would be pills that you could take early on after a COVID diagnosis, kind of like Tamiflu. Merck has uh, a compound that uh, in license from Ridgeback Bio that's sort of repurposed. They're trying to um, apply it to the coronavirus. Pfizer has an antiviral that it developed um, specifically for this coronavirus, and we're expecting data from both of those over the course of this fall, I believe. How um, how hopeful are you that those and others that are being worked on from Roche and Atia and other smaller companies will work uh, and that will have a new tool uh, on the near term. Look, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm, I'm fairly optimistic and I could say almost fairly certain that we're going to get an antiviral drug that inhibits viral replication. This isn't a hard, this shouldn't be a hard virus to drug. The targets that we're um, going after with this virus, we've gone after with in the context of other viruses and we've been able to drug those targets. Um, you know, these are first generation antivirals. In many cases, these were antiviral drugs that were available and are being repurposed for coronavirus. We're going to see second and third generation antivirals come into the market that are specifically designed to target this specific coronavirus. But even this first generation tranche of drugs, people are reasonably optimistic about. I mean, Pfizer is certainly optimistic about the drug they have in advanced development, um, a protease inhibitor. The drug that Merck and licensed from Ridgeback, that's a very good drug hunting team that discovered that drug. It's the same team that actually developed the first antibody drug against Ebola. So they've had a lot of success. Um, it's a husband and wife team. They're, they're, they've been very successful finding effective drugs. They found this one. Merck licensed it. Um, the data looks good. Roche is a little bit further behind. I would say Pfizer and Merck are sort of equidistant and further ahead. Roche is a little bit further behind, but they have a very interesting compound. One or more of these may work and may be quite effective. And even if they don't, as you said, there's a lot of other compounds behind them, including compounds that are being developed by Pfizer, Roche, and Merck that are sort of second-generation antivirals. So we're going to end up with a small molecule inhibitor of viral replication that hopefully is you know, safe enough, non-toxic enough that it could be used on an outpatient basis, not just to prevent progression to severe symptoms in people who develop COVID who are diagnosed with it, but also be, being used as a prophylaxis like Tamiflu is for people who come into contact with COVID and may be at higher risk of a bad outcome. I will just say, finally, the clinical trials are going to be hard to do because um, doing a clinical trial where you demonstrate that a drug prevents progression to severe disease or prevents onset of infection in a largely vaccinated population in a Western society right now, that's a hard trial to run. And it's a hard trial to run even if you run it in a population where people don't have prior exposure to the virus because most people don't progress to severe disease. So if your endpoint is, is, you know, reducing progression to severe disease, you need a very large trial to be able to demonstrate a statistically significant effect. So these aren't going to be easy trials to necessarily run. So the regulatory path is going to be complex, like, like it was for Tamiflu. But I certainly think that we're going to find effective drugs for this, uh, this target. Well, let's um, turn in our, our last bit of our conversation to to kind of what comes next. And I want to uh, depend a lot on the on your your book that's coming out uh, at the end of this month, Uncontrolled Spread. Um, you you look a lot at, at what happened and what went wrong, but you also look forward to what needs to happen to put us in a better position next time. But I was sort of disheartened reading um, your sort of summaries of the threats that we've been through and how little we uh, use those as preparation for something like this. You, you point out that attention spans essentially are there during the threat and then go away. And you pointed out this um, through each administration, this really happened over, back to the, to the Bush years. How are you seeing that we're putting things in place now that are going to stop us from being in this position in the future? Or are we doomed to another short attention span and just relief whenever this ends, it's finally over? Yeah, well, surprisingly, we really even we haven't even begun to put in place the infrastructure we're going to need to guard against these threats in the future. Or I think really had a public discussion about it. And, you know, I tell myself, well, maybe it's too early for that discussion. That's why you don't see Congress or the administration working on, you know, what is the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act, the next iteration of that, that's going to put in place a different infrastructure to guard against this. But we haven't even begun that discussion. Uh, we're going to need a much different capacity in the United States to do the mobilization that's required to respond to a public health crisis of this magnitude. We don't have it. We thought the CDC was that organization. The CDC is a very retrospective organization, a high science organization that really doesn't have an operational capacity to handle something of this magnitude. And I think everyone assumed it, it did and it would run point. And I think it was put in a very unfair position, but it certainly couldn't 
fulfill the mandate. I think we we lack the ability, the sort of reserve capacity to scale the production of things like drugs and vaccines in an emergency. We're far too dependent upon a global supply chain that's going to be tugged on by every country in the world in the setting of a global crisis. You know, we never thought about the fact that we'd run out of masks because if it was actually a pandemic, everyone would want masks at the same time. So we were dependent upon a global supply chain that suddenly was in global demand. We don't have information gathering capacity that we need to provide real-time information to inform policy decisions that have to get made in the moment. Again, CDC was relied on for that, but it's a very retrospective organization. They're going to do an exquisite analysis of just how you know, bad this Delta wave was in about five months and publish it in JAMA. And it's going to be really good science, but, you know, we needed that information right now. We don't need it in four months. And it's the orientation of CDC is to be very retrospective. So we need a different capacity there. And then finally, we need a different overseas capacity. We've, we've relied on sort of multilateral agreements and the goodwill of nations and capacity building abroad to warn us about these kinds of emerging risks and these outbreaks. And these outbreaks have happened before. And we've seen time and time again, countries don't inform, they conceal them. And it was concealed in this case as well. And there was information available that could have been intercepted if we had a clandestine uh, operators operating overseas as part of the global public health mission that could have warned us of this virus earlier. Certainly by mid-December, you saw Chinese physicians, we know this now publicly, sending off um, samples of this virus to be sequenced. That could have been intercepted. And we could have known that there was a SARS-like virus circulating in Wuhan that was causing severe disease in, a, in a, a number of people and that Chinese physicians were worried about it. But the reality is, you know, our clandestine operators, our clandestine agencies haven't traditionally been engaged in the public health mission. It's been seen as something that's left to CDC. CDC didn't want our overseas, you know, spy agencies anywhere near this mission for fear that it would impugn and, and, and put at risk their um, multilateral agreements and arrangements. And CDC traditionally, and the spy agencies traditionally saw this as something that was left to public health authorities like CDC. That has to change. We need to look at public health preparedness through the lens of national security and get more of our um, national security infrastructure engaged in monitoring for these threats. And I think there's a way for the two to coexist if we do it right and we do it in a sort of honest fashion. Every other country is doing this the U.S. is going to have to as well. Just in our last minute of time, and I know it's not enough to dedicate to this topic, but you spend a lot of time in the book detailing the, the early testing failures. We, we know about the CDC test that failed early on. Um, how do we do this right the next time in 45 seconds or less? Yeah, we look, look at what South Korea did. I mean, even if the CDC had, had succeeded in rolling out the CDC test, the reality was they were going to distribute that to the 100 public health labs in the country, which each had the capacity to run 100 tests a day. That's 10,000 tests. We needed, you know, 2 million tests, not 10,000. So even if CDC had succeeded in its mission, it still would have been a fraction of a fraction of what was required. We needed to do a very rapid handoff to industry to scale massive amounts of testing early. The South Koreans did that. And in fact, we ultimately got enough tests into the market when a single manufacturer, IDT, was able to um, start distributing primer and probe kits that they had made. They had made them for research use only. And FDA, seeing these kits said, we can authorize these for testing of patients, and this could help fill, fill the testing void. And they did that. They actually did that over the, um, consternation might be a strong word, but, but over some of the objections of CDC, which didn't want to um, certify the tests for patient use because they weren't CDC tests. So ultimately, the testing void was filled when we got a manufacturer into the game. But we needed to turn to Kaidel and Roche and all the big manufacturers early and say to them sometime in January, guys, we need you to start manufacturing tests at scale. This may turn into a global pandemic, a public health emergency, and we may need capacity um, that we can't envision right now. And I'm hard pressed to believe those companies would have said no if the government had approached them. And, and the government could have put resources behind it. We could have had BARDA actually allocate money to offset the risk and the cost of the manufacturers doing that. Right. That is one thing we really have seen through this pandemic is when the government can take the risk out of the development for industry. That gets a lot of things done. Uh, one of the things I love about your book, and, and I'll wrap up here, is just you talk so fast. It's like a footnote footnotes to your brain in this book. Like you actually have footnotes. I can figure out where your information is coming from. It's like the encyclopedia of Scott Gottlieb's brain right here. And it's really, really, really was helpful to me to read. So, Scott, thank you. Thanks a lot. 